verse 21. Here's what the Bible says. It says, then Peter, then come Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times, should I forgive him seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say unto thee, until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Let's go to Matthew chapter five. We're going to look at um, verse number thirty-nine. Hallelujah! Matthew chapter five, verse thirty-nine. Say amen when you get there. Here's what it says. It says, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. In other words, someone smacks you on the right side. Scripture is telling us, turn to the other side and let them smack you on that one. Interesting. Now, Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse number 16. Say amen when you get there. Here's what the Bible says. It says, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Last verse we're going to look at today uh, for this opening is Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, uh, starting at verse number 17. Romans chapter 16, starting at verse number 17. The Bible says this, says, I now, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, underline that. Mark them, underline that. Say mark them. Which calls division, underline that. We'll start over because this is important. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine, say doctrine, which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus, but they serve their own belly. Wow. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Y'all see this? Today I want to teach from uh, the subject, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Um, won't you tell somebody that? Tell them, say enough is enough. <laughs> we have seemingly in these scriptures, contradictions. Why do we have contradictions seemingly? Because the first two scriptures seem to highlight the fact uh, that as Christians, as believers, um, God is very interested in our ability to forgive those that abuse us. Seemingly, God is very interested in us forgiving those that mistreat us. As a matter of fact, a scripture that I didn't even go to was God says to pray for them that what? Despitefully use you. Uh huh. And so God, throughout scripture, there seems to be a very consistent theme that when people do you wrong, when people mistreat you, that there should be uh, something in you, a component in you, a, a mechanism in you that allows you to forgive them. 
the scripture even goes further in Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, uh, and it talks about how if someone smacks you or someone strikes you on one cheek, you're supposed to turn the other. I had some people that was listening to me read the scripture. You couldn't even read the whole scripture because you just imagine in your mind somebody striking you, somebody smacking you. Listen, listen. Some of you is like, that's not an option, Pastor Jay. I mean, I, I love the word. I love God, but I'm trying to tell you I'm not there yet. Yeah, a whole lot of you are not there yet. <laughs> But the scripture highlights, it says if, 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 if one of your cheeks are smacked, turn to the other one. And so um, God seems to be, as we read these scriptures, um, letting us know that, uh, that we need to be able to forgive, not just forgive, times seven. Forgive and 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 keep forgiving and keep forgiving and keep forgiving over and over and over and over again, over, over and over again. But when is it okay to end it? When? When is enough enough? When do we reach the point of 70 times 7 expiration? Say amen if you're here. And so then there comes some tension because when we scoot down to 10, Matthew chapter 10 verse 16, it starts talking about us being wise serpents because I've sent you amongst people who want to misuse you. I've sent you amongst people who want to devour you. Say devour. It says I've sent you in the midst of wolves and you are sheep. And y'all know what wolves do to sheep. And so now we get some seeming tension because God says now after he tells me all right let them abuse you let them misuse you if they smack you turn the other cheek but then he says be wise because uh, their intentions for you are not good so he says I want you to be wise as a serpent but harmless as a dove and then we go a little further and when we look at uh, Romans, it gets even more intense because he says, not only do I want you to be wise, but I want you to mark them. Now, where is my Christian responsibility lie when I know I'm in the presence of someone who means me no good? What is the accuracy of my response as a Christian when I know you want to hurt me? Are y'all here? Ask your neighbor, when does it need to end? Okay. Now, we talked last week about infidelity. We talked about unfaithfulness people that don't mean you any good, it will manifest itself in various ways. One is they can't be faithful to you. They, 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 can't, they can't express loyalty to you. All right? They will get what they need from you and cause you to give them the best of you, not realizing that the best of you being offered is connected to an emotional attachment. And so because the best of me being offered is attached to an emotional attachment, when you try to pull away from me, it's not just as simple as what I can do for you, it's now how I feel about you. Because I felt so strongly about you that I offered you the best I had. And so, so now they step away and they find 
another that can give them what you could give them. Right? And now you are filling this enormous void because you can no longer get the attachment even when it comes with abuse. Because after you give someone the best of you, you will willingly take the least of them. Because once you cross over to a certain atmosphere of love and intimacy, you're willing to take the scraps when you really deserve the whole loaf. But you'll take it because you are so in tune and so intimate. And so now you feel abused and drained and hurt because someone could not be faithful. Couldn't be faithful to the best of you. Are y'all okay? And so last week I taught you about the stages of how unfaithfulness works. Y'all remember that? We talked about observation, temptation, invitation, consideration, and then ultimately participation, right? And so uh, now that we've dealt with the infidelity piece, now we must deal with the forgiveness piece or the forgetting piece. Either I'm going to forgive or I'm going to move on. Where do we land? Are y'all still okay? Yeah. I'm just slow walking because I'm working on something, okay? All right. Um, so I want to give you all three components today of how you determine when it's time to let it go. When it's time to move on. All right. And I don't want to just, I don't want to just rile your emotions about uh, the opportunity to leave someone. I want to have you better suited with scriptural context so that you can stay in compliance with heaven when you move on. Because you don't, watch this, because you don't want to give up on somebody that really was your assignment and you gave up on them because you were just being inconvenienced. This is not about being inconvenienced. This is not about being inconvenienced. Tell your neighbor, this is not about inconvenience. Okay. Uh, this goes much deeper. This actually goes all the way back to being unequally yoked. It goes back to being in relationship with the infidel. Infidel, root word of infidelity. They cannot be faithful to you because you don't have enough in common in your core value system. The core values are off. Okay? All right? The core values are off. So, are y'all ready for our three points? Okay. How do you know, Pastor Jay, when it's time to let it go. How do you know when you're in relationship and you're being abused and you're being abused and you've, you've surpassed the point of turning the other cheek? The first thing you have to do is you have to go to the end. Say go to the end. Now, I need to explain this a little bit because um, it, it, it's, going, it's just going to take a little bit of explanation. But when I say go to the end, what I really mean is that uh, I need you to consider the potential of your end, watch this, not by death, but by humiliation. Stay with me. See, there's something uh, about loving someone, being with someone, everything's good, and they're your ride or die. Right? But what I found is, when you go to the end, very many of the ride or die are really your run and hide. Because, because, listen, you're my ride or die as long as I'm respected. 
But what happens if I become humiliated? See, if I become humiliated, many of the people that I claim that claim to be a ride or die will run and hide. They will act as if they never knew me. They will, they will deny affiliation with me. They will not come to my rescue. They will not, I will not be able to talk to them. I will not be able to counsel with them. They will be talking about me instead of talking to me. And you need to do an inventory. Say inventory. You need to do an inventory of everybody in your life right now that will stand with you firm and tall as long as you're winning. They'll stand with you as long as you're on the right side of victory. They'll stand with you as long as you can put gas in their car and pay for their meal at Applebee's. They'll stand with you as long as things are going well and everything seems honky-dory. They'll stand with you. They'll stand with you. But the moment that you get in some trouble, the moment that you're in perfect imperfection, the moment that you have a slight error in your life, they will run and hide from you and they'll act like they don't know you and they'll talk about you as if you're a stranger. And when they got in trouble, they slept on your couch. When they got in trouble, you paid their bills. When they got in trouble, you stood with them. When they got in trouble, you were there for them. When they got in trouble, you supported them. But now that you are in trouble, you can't find nobody. See, I only, you only need people close enough to you that can endure not just when things are going well, but they can endure when things get a little rocky. Some of you, you say that God has his hand on your life and you're supremely gifted and, you, and, you, and you're going places and you're going to the nations and you're going this and you're going that. I want to announce something to you. I want to tell you something. If you are really as anointed as you think, I want to give you a guarantee. The guarantee is at some point in your anointment, watch this, pay attention, don't you ever forget it. Watch this. You will be lied on. And I'm not talking about just some kind of casual lie. I'm talking about people that go to the depths of hell to try to find something to discredit your name. And listen, baby, if you ain't got no people around you that will stand with you, that know your character, that know who you are in good times or bad, you will be devoured by the same anointing that you team to boast about. Yeah, that anointing. you claiming about all the great things you're going to do. Let me tell you something, baby. There will be stories that will be conjured up about you. People will not like you. They will attack your character for no reason at all. You at home minding your business, watching, watching Sports Center, watching The Voice, whatever you watch, whatever you do. You at home minding your business. And they are working overtime. working overtime to try to knock you off your so-called pedestal. Yeah. But if you're wise, if you're wise, you will keep people around you that can endure the lie. Y'all don't want to have church today. You don't want to have churches. I'm, not, I'm telling you the truth. You will keep some people around you that can look somebody in their eyes and say, yeah, I hear what you're saying, baby, but I know them. Hallelujah. I know them, and that does not match their character. Yeah. yeah. And see, and while I'm on it, while I'm on it, see, some of us, some of us, see, you really, <laughs> listen, some of you, I'm going to be honest, you don't got to do it publicly, but you need to do it privately at some point. You got some repenting to do. And I'm going to tell you why. You got some repenting to do.
because maybe you weren't the person that told a lie, but you developed an opinion based on the lie. And so you're walking around feeling some kind of way about a person that you never met, you never talked to, you didn't get to know them, you haven't spent no time with them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And you got a whole story, a whole idea of who they are, and you never took the time to say, let's have coffee, let's talk, Let me, let's get to know each other. Why? Because you lived and you based your opinion on the, on the opinion of a lie. Are y'all okay? Sometimes you, you got it wrong about a person. You got it wrong. And you really need to give them the opportunity. Am I making any sense today? The second point is confusion. Confusion. Let's go to 1 Corinthians uh, Media team, I didn't give you all this scripture. It just, it just came to me during worship. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14. Y'all find it for me if you can. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Thank you all. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. Y'all there? If you're not there yet, look to the screen. Here's what it says. It said, for God is not the author, underline author, of confusion. In other words, um, God cannot, does not, will not create confusion. How do you know that it's time to end? Because every time you turn around, there's confusion. Wherever the enemy is, there's confusion. You don't have, you don't have, to, have, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know this. If there's confusion, the enemy's in it. I'm not talking about inconvenience. I'm talking about confusion. Two different spirits. Sometimes you got to work a little harder. Sometimes you're being thrown into confusion. For God is not the author, meaning he did not write the script. He did not create it. He did not, he did not manipulate uh, uh, the world to have confusion. God is very clear, concise, straightforward. And so you're in this relationship and... Um, you're trying to figure out, well, God, you know, I love him. I love him. He's so good to me. And, you know, I love her. And, see, what, what, what I always am trying to understand is, is that because love is not easy, but it's not confusing either. Say man. Amen. See, when confusion gets in, that means that there is a plant set. There's a trap set. Because wherever there's confusion, See, we can't navigate around it. We gotta, it's kind of like a, a rug that has something uh, uh, like trash stuffed up under it. And every time you try to run, you fall over it. Right. See, confusion is something you can't get around. It slows you down. It stops your progress. And you cannot untie it until there are two willing parties willing to untie it. Say confusion. So if you're in a relationship and there's constantly confusion, this is a relationship that's probably unequally yoked. 
honey, honey for the yoke. Are y'all okay? Now, the third and the final point I'm going to make, and then we're going home, is virtue. Say virtue. Uh, go to the book of Luke chapter 8 verse 45 while, while y'all are getting that could you take that chair for me and just uh, you want to do it up here yeah bring it up here if you could um, thank you sir yeah right here is good Um, and that's what I need over there. So, um, y'all got Luke chapter 8, verse 45? Here's what it says. It says, and Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody has touched me. For I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. Somebody say virtue. Virtue is designed for healing. Virtue is not designed for mediation. I'm going to teach this, okay? Virtue is designed for healing. Jesus is going through the crowd and he says to Peter, somebody touched me. Peter says, Jesus, you tripping, man. You've been in the sun too long. It's, it's a whole lot of people out here. It's hundreds of people out here. Jesus said, that's not what I'm talking about. He says, somebody touched an inner part of me. Because how do I know? Because it drained me. Man, oh man. I want to teach this. He said, because I felt Virtue, leave me. I felt tired. My God. He said, virtue left me. Virtue left me. Virtue left me. That's how I know somebody touched me. That's how I know someone was sincere. That's how I know. That's how I know somebody wants change. That's how I know. I'm teaching this thing. That's how I know somebody is serious about change because virtue, fatigue hit my body. And we're spending 30 minutes, 45 minutes, hour talking to people leaving the meeting drained and nothing changed. I'm coming for that devil today. Jesus said, I know, I know that somebody touched me. I know someone touched my heart because virtue left me. I don't feel the same. My body has lost something. Something's come out of me and it went to her. Are y'all here? Can I take this a little further? Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Now I'm going to pause there. Pause there real quick. Get the scripture. I need a few, few volunteers. Pastor Malik, come up here with me. I want you to sit in the chair, if you could. Um, let's see here. All right. Um, Greg, come. Jason, come if you could. Um, Need two more. Cynthia, come if you could. Uh, come on, Miss Miss Booker. Yeah, you don't want to come. I'm sorry. You okay? You, I know you. You all right? You sure? You sure? You <laughs> now here's what I want y'all to come on up one more, one more. Here's what I want y'all to do. I want y'all to stand in a line in front of Pastor Malik. Just a single file line. Yeah. No, honey. <laughs> All, right. All right. Good, 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 good. Y'all here? We almost done. Okay, now, this is 
Pastor Malik's virtue. No matter who you are in this building, all of you only have a certain amount of virtue. Am I making sense so far? All right. God doesn't give anyone any more than the other. What happens is, it's how you manage it. It's how you preserve it. It's how it's replenished, right? But you don't get any more. It just gets replenished. You got it? So this is his virtue. All right. Take one. Take one. You took two. That's all right. That's fine. Okay. That's good. So watch this. So all of you have people in your life like this. This is your friends, your inner circle, your spouse. The reality is that they're all in line for your virtue. Every day, every week, you're facing this. All right, I want you to spend a little, you had your time with, with Pastor Malik, give her, some, give her a good portion of your virtue. Okay, all right, now you step to the side. Yes, yeah, step to the side, now you come on up. Give him a little bit, give him, give him a little more than that. Okay, good, good. Now you step to the side. You had your time with him? You had your time with him? All right. Give him a little bit. Okay. Now you step to the side. Now you give him what you got. Okay. That's good. Okay, now step to the side. Now, here's how you know if the relationships in your life are approaching uh, expiration or if they have value. If you're spending time with all these people, watch this, and they leave your presence, and this is all you got. Y'all ain't hearing me today. Now look, now look. He got your virtue, but he ain't got no change. Which means, see, if people are taking your virtue, but nothing is materializing, I'm talking about every time you're in their presence, you lose a little bit of yourself. You lose a little bit of your energy. You lose a little bit of your patience. You lose a little bit of your, are you hearing me? Every time you meet with them, you lose this. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, is that I've given them my virtue, and most times, uh, here's what they'll do. I wish somebody bring me, so bring me a trash can or something I can pour this. See, because here's what happened. I should have thought this. I should have thought about this, but the Lord, the, Lord, the Lord deals with me as I'm talking. Okay. Oh, perfect. See, the God is good, y'all. So, so we're going to do this again, and I'm going to show y'all what happens and why you need to let some people go. Not everybody, but some people go. All right, ha have your meeting, sir. Have your meeting. Have your conversation. Have your inbox or whatever with Pastor Malik. Go ahead and meet with him. Now, give him what you got. Give him your virtue. Now, watch. This is what happens, y'all. We meet with people. We give them our time. We give them our energy. We give him our virtue. We have the conversation. Watch what he's going to do. Come over here and pour it out. Come over here. Look. He walks right over and, and pours it out. And pours it out. Watch this. And then goes and hides it. Because, because, right? And then, because, see, when people have no interest, no interest in change or no interest in in the value of the relationship, they'll take your virtue and have no desire to replenish it. No desire to put anything back. Just take it and waste it. All right. Now y'all get back in line real quick. Get back in line, get back in line. Same order. Yep, perfect, 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 perfect. Now, can I go deeper? Are you sure? How much time we got? We got two minutes. Watch this. So y'all saw he had the meeting, right? Got the virtue, poured it out, hid it, 
so it can't be replenished. Here's what, ha here's what happens next. He gets back in line. He gets back in line, but I ain't done. Not only is he back in line, are y'all ready for this? Watch this. He then, look for a second. He then creates a, no, -uh, no. He, well, yes. He creates a view of Pastor Malik that's behind the virtue he's wasted. So in other words, his criticisms start like, well, you know, Pastor Malik, he just, he don't preach like he used to. You know, I just, I feel like something different about him. He ain't, he ain't, he ain't the same no more. He don't, he don't, he don't spend time with me no more. He, you know, I, I had, you know, I, I used to, I used to have, I can't talk, I can't get to him. He don't preach like he used to. I mean, something's different. Something's off. Because why? Because his view is behind wasted virtue. So he's seeing a depleted version. See, when we started, his cup was full. Now his cup is empty. And you got people getting back in line, critiquing and criticizing a vessel that's empty. Maybe he's not preaching like he used to, but maybe he's empty because you're draining him. Maybe, maybe he's drained. Maybe he don't have nothing left. And I'm using this in the context of a pastor, but this is applicable to all of you. Because as people start to find little things about you, it's typically going to be the same people, the very people that drained you in the first place. And so you have to get to a place where you say, you know what? All right, y'all step to the side. No, matter of fact, give him some back, okay? Let's just say he gets to go on vacation and he gets some of it back. Step to the side. You give, yep, yes, ma'am. Step to the side. Give him some. Thank you. Good. Give him some. Okay. Thank you. All right. Very good. Now, come on up. Back in line. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Now, let's just say he gets to step away for a few weeks, you know, Get some, some blue water and some sand in between his toes. And, and so he's got, he's got some of his virtue has been replenished. Turn his phone off. Shut down for a while. Okay? But here's the whole point of the whole sermon. He's back in line. You got a decision to make. You got a decision to make, church. At some point, at some point, you got to, he's got to come to have his meeting, and Pastor Malik has got to make a decision. Is it more important? To preserve your virtue, because guess what? The woman with the issue, now here's what I need. Um, give me this real quick. All right. I'm going to show y'all something. And I'm done, for real. I'm done. But the Lord is still speaking. So, all right. I need a, uh, Elder Paula, where you at? Come on up here real quick. Because here's the part, because some of y'all saying, Pastor Jay, he he always come up with these examples, and I can't find him, and I don't know what he's talking about. He ain't in the Bible. He don't know what I'm saying. Stand behind him. And see, um, because, you know, and, and whatever. But here's the reality of it is that this is, because sometimes people will feel like 
you know, you can be someone's savior. The only problem is, is you haven't learned yet, they don't want to be saved yet. They're not ready. So here's, here's the reality, is that not only does he have a choice, because this, this person wants more of his virtue, but this person wants healing. And if he wasted on him, he won't have nothing for her. So he's already made up his mind that I'm going to spend the time with him, but at the, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but what we don't realize is that, go ahead and say, just tell him like this. No, no, bro. No. See, see, what, see you got to get out of line. See, because what happens is, and go step to the side. Thank you, sir. Because what happens is, is that once he preserved it, step on up kind of slow. Go ahead. And see, now the person who really needs it, The person who really needs it, the person who really needs it can get it. 